Many mysteries surround the death of Frederick Barbarossa. To this day, we do not know for sure why the man who was probably the most famous emperor of the Middle Ages drowned. It is also unclear where he was buried. Since the 16th century, the legend has also circulated that he was sleeping in the Kiffhäuser Mountains in eastern Germany in order to lead his homeland into a new golden age at the right time. The Nazis did feel inspired by this, but watch this video to the end to find out more. It should already be mentioned that Barbarossa's death has repeatedly provoked the counterfactual question of what would have happened if he had not died. Historians do not normally engage in counterfactual history, but in this case an exception should be made because the Muslim chronicler Ibn al-Atir already dealt with it. His answer was, without Barbarossa's death, it would have been common to say Syria and Egypt once belonged to the Muslims. This video is largely based on the work of the German historian Knut Görich, who in my opinion knows all the sources on Barbarossa's life better than anyone else. Of course, I have also consulted other works and read relevant sources myself, but I take figures in particular from Görich. It is widely known that Barbarossa died on the Third Crusade. He drowned in the river Salif. What is less well known is that the emperor was the only European ruler to go on crusade twice. He accompanied his uncle King Conrad from 1147 to 1149. However, the monarch at the time had to abandon his military campaign as he fell ill with malaria. Barbarossa, who had received this nickname in Italy due to his red beard, had the crusade proclaimed on March 27, 1188 at a court meeting in Mainz. A year later, the entourage set off, accompanied by numerous representatives of the high nobility. Among them was Frederick of Swabia, one of Barbarossa's sons. The emperor appointed his eldest son Henry as regent for the duration of his absence, who had already been elected king at the age of three. The German army probably numbered around 15,000 men. This made it the largest single army that had ever set out on crusade. I know that there are other figures that are significantly higher. In all probability, they are grossly exaggerated. Barbarossa decided that he wanted to take the overland route to the Holy Land. The reason is unclear. However, there's a legend that I would like to share with you. According to it, an astrologer predicted that Barbarossa would drown if he went to the Holy Land. The campaign went relatively well. However, problems began on the territory of the Byzantine Empire. The people there were anything but happy to see the large German army. The emperor threatened his counterpart Isaac that he would take what he needed if the Byzantines did not support him. This had an effect. Barbarossa was even awarded the title Emperor of Ancient Rome. In Asia Minor, the difficulties increased. The German soldiers lost much of their equipment in difficult terrain. The hostile Muslim population repeatedly laid ambushes. Diseases were also rampant in the army. Several bishops died of exhaustion. It was extremely hot and the troops had to contend with the lack of water. As a result, the army almost lost the only battle it had to fight under Barbarossa as part of the crusade. The Germans were attacked by the Saracens near Iconia in May 1190. They turned to flee. Allegedly, only the Emperor himself was able to avert this. He is said to have shouted the following sentences and said at the top of his nights, Why do you hesitate? Why do you lament? You who left your homeland to buy the kingdom of heaven with your blood. Christ commands. Christ conquers. This allegedly inspired the troops to put the enemy to flight, who are said to have lost 3,000 men in the encounter. Despite the victory, the military campaign didn't get any easier. 
I have put together some pictures from our time to show where the Emperor led his army. We have an impressive report from an unknown member of the army, presumably from Barbarossa's chancellery, which describes the hardships of the march in detail. I would like to quote just one excerpt at this point. Who would be so hard-hearted and so jaded as not to be utterly moved to tears when he saw how bishops and the most distinguished knights two week after long illness were dragged down on horseback on the much too narrow stony path the front horse sometimes also the rear one brought its master whom it carried and itself into mortal danger if it fell unhappily here one saw how praiseworthy and highly rewarding was the effort of those who are called shield bearers who carried their big masters over this mountain by the sweat of their brow. Finally, the army reached the river that is now called Gürksu. Barbarossa drowned. A member of the army platoon describes what happens as follows. Also, everyone tried to hold him back. He climbed into the water, sank into a whirlpool. He, who had often escaped from the greatest danger, and sank miserably. We entrust ourselves to God's hidden counsel, whom no one may ask, why do you act like this? What does he intend with the death of such a man, such a great man? After all, he was a knight of Christ, stood in his knightly service and was engaged in the glorious project of regaining the Lord's land and cross, that he entered salvation, even if suddenly taken away, we trust without doubt. All the noble gentlemen around him rushed to his aid, but too late. They pulled him out of the water and onto the shore. They were all deeply shocked by his death and so crushed with grief that some, wavering between fear and hope, ended their lives with him. Others, however, despaired because it seemed to them that God would not take care of them. They gave up their Christian faith and shared customs with the pagans. Grief and immeasurable pain rightly gripe the hearts of all in the face of the death of such a famous prince. So they rightly wept with the prophet and cried out, The crown has fallen from our heads. Woe to us that we have sinned. Therefore our heart is sick. The Duke of Swabia, the most illustrious prince and most distinguished heir of the father, was also chosen by all as the leader of Christ's army and proclaimed with great approval. It is striking that no reason is given as to why the then 68-year-old went into the water. Two versions are circulating. Firstly, it took too long to cross a small bridge for the liking of the emperor. He therefore tried to cross the river on his horse and was swept away by the floods. Secondly, the Saxon World Chronicle, written in the 13th century, reports that Barbarossa wanted to cool off after lunch. He underestimated the external conditions. It gets very hot in the region during the day in June, but the water in the river is still ice cold. In our time, we assume the second option to be the right one and suspect that Barbarossa suffered a heart attack. Further rumors quickly arose. Barbarossa swam in the river because Alexander the Great had done the same, for example. In another version, Alexander died almost at the same spot where Barbarossa fell victim to the astrologer's prophecy should it have actually existed. In 1971, the German embassy erected a memorial plaque to Barbarossa at the alleged site of the accident, which still exists today. Frederick of Swabia first took care of the burial of his father. Barbarossa actually wanted to be buried in the German city of Speyer, which was impossible due to the circumstances. Instead, the corpse was treated according to a procedure called Mos Teutonicus, or German way, to prevent decomposition. By boiling the bones, the flesh was detached from them. The original intention was to bury the skeleton in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. However, as the crusade failed, this was not possible. 
Instead, it was buried entire. We no longer exactly know where Barbarossa's grave is located. The rest of the crusade turned into a disaster. The Germans who reached Acre were mocked by the Muslim defenders. You wretches, what else do you hope for? You were expecting the imminent arrival of your emperor, but he has drowned. They are said to have edged from the walls. The remnants of the German army scattered. The death of the emperor was not a catastrophe for the empire itself, as Henry VI was a well-known and respected successor. Despite the mourning over Barbarossa's death, there was therefore no widespread desire for his return. This changed after the death of his grandson, Emperor Frederick II, in the middle of the 13th century. The Hohenstaufen dynasty came to an end. The empire slipped into the so-called interregnum, a phase in which there was no emperor. As a result, false Fredericks quickly emerged, claiming to be the returned emperor. In Italy, there were even notarized bets that he was not dead. Dietrich Holzschuh, one of the false Fredericks, was able to hold his own for a year and had to be removed by the military. Evidence of the last false Frederick dates back to 1546. In the 14th century, the return of Frederick II was spiritually charged. John of Winterthur, for example, wrote in 1348, he, meaning Frederick, will return with the glory of the Rome and fulfill all justice, but he will persecute the clergy terribly and the monks from the earth. Johannes Rote shifted the events to the Kiffhauser Mountains. Frederick walked through the relics of the castle here he wrote in 1420. At the beginning of the 16th century, Frederick II finally became Frederick Barbarossa. The first surviving evidence of this is a letter from the physician Adelphus of Landshut, who had Barbarossa sleep in a hollow mountain and wait for the time for his return. The legend became more and more elaborate over time. Barbarossa had been magically transported to the Kiffhauser mountain, it was said. Here he sat asleep on an ivory chair. He would wake up every hundred years and see if the ravens were still flying around the mountain. They are a sign of discord and unhappiness. If the ravens are still flying, he sits down again and sleeps for another hundred years. He would return when his beard had grown completely around the marble table surrounding his throne and a mighty eagle had driven away the ravens. The reason why Frederick II became Barbarossa over the course of time became clear in the 19th century. The red-bearded emperor was much better suited to national appropriation than his grandson, who felt most at home in Sicily. An 89-meter-high equestrian monument was erected for the first emperor of the Second Empire, Wilhelm I, on the Kiffhauser Mountain in 1888. The awakening Barbarossa is located in the pedestal. Similar imagery exists in some work of art. In one case, for example, Barbarossa is the godfather in heaven for the founding of the empire in 1871 and is reminiscent of God watching the baptism of Jesus. The Nazis took an early liking to Barbarossa. He was the first man to aggressively promote the idea of German culture to the outside world, they said. There was only one exception, but it was a big one. Adolf Hitler. He only mentioned Barbarossa in a single speech, which he gave in 1927, six years before he came to power. It is therefore surprising that the Nazi attack on Russia in 1941, which was recorded in Directive 21, was given the code name Case Barbarossa or in German Fall Barbarossa. Especially as the project was not called that for a long time. When the Wehrmacht leadership commissioned the first concrete plans in the summer of 1940, they were called Plan Fritz, Operationsstudie Ost, Operationsentwurf Ost. Paulus, commander in chief of the Sixth Army, which was to surrender at Stalingrad a few years later, held a war game in December 1940 called Operation Otto. This was also the Wehrmacht's codename for the invasion of Austria in 1938 and for a plan to expand the infrastructure in occupied central Poland in order to be able to move troops quickly to the east. 
named Barbarossa was finally decided on between December 5th and 17th, 1940, as it is mentioned in the aforementioned Directive 21, dated December 18th. Lieutenant Colonel Bernhard von Losberg claimed the idea for this name in 1956. He had convinced his superior Alfred Jodel in a letter, he said. Losberg provided no justification for the name, nor was it questioned for a long time. There were two reasons for this. Firstly, the Wehrmacht had no real system for naming its plans. The attack on France, Belgium and the Netherlands in 1940, for example, was called Fallgelb or Case Yellow. Secondly, it was and is assumed that the Nazis were primarily interested in building on Barbarossa's fame. However, I think that the name is an allusion to the legend. This was to be made indirectly true. Barbarossa would have risen again in the form of the victorious Wehrmacht and would have led the nation to a new golden age. As we know, things turned out differently and there was no trace of Barbarossa himself. So we can probably assume that the emperor sleeping in the mountain did not sympathize with the Nazis.